Hello, good evening, welcome back. Your pal Nick Sal here, continuing a dramatic reading of His Majesty's Dragon, book one of the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik. Where I last left you, we had just finished up chapter eight, and we're embarking on the third section of this great novel. And uh, we pick up with our heroes heading to the south coast of England to investigate a potential invasion, perhaps a fleet action, perhaps an aerial battle, who knows? But they're being called to the line of duty. And we're fine, and I think Tamarare and Lawrence and everybody, their whole crew, they're finally going to see what they can really do. Uh, so let us begin chapter nine. The rifle ball passed so close it stirred Lawrence's hair. The crack of return fire sounded behind him, and Temeraire slashed out at the French dragon as they swept past, raking the deep blue hide with long gashes, even as he twisted gracefully to avoid the other dragon's talons. "'It's a fleur de nuit, sir, the coloring," Granby shouted, wind whipping away at his hair as the blue dragon pulled away with a bellow and wheeled about for another attempt at the formation, its crew already clambering down to staunch the bleeding— the wounds were not disabling. Lawrence nodded. Yes, Mr. Martin, he called once more, uh, called more loudly. Get the flash powder ready. We'll give them a show on their next pass. The French breed were heavily built and dangerous, but they were nocturnal by nature and their eyes sensitive to sudden flashes of bright light. Mr. Turner, the flash powder warning signal, if you please. A quick confirmation came from Masoria's signal ensign. The Yellow Reaper was herself engaged in fending off a spirited attack against the front of the formation by a French middleweight. Lawrence reached out to pat Temeraire's neck, catching his attention. "'We're going to give the fleur de nuit a dose of flash powder,' he shouted. "'Hold this position and wait for the signal.' "'Yes, I am ready,' Temeraire said, a deep note of excitement ringing in his voice. He was almost trembling." "'Pray be careful,' Lawrence could not help adding. The French dragon was an older one, judging by its scars, and he did not want Tamarare to be hurt through, uh, through... to be hurt through overconfidence. Oh, he didn't want it to be hurt through overconfidence, right. The fleur, de nuit, the fleur de nuit arrowed towards them, trying once again to barrel between Tamarare and Natidus. The goal was clearly to split apart the formation, injuring one or the other dragon in the process, which would leave Lily vulnerable to attack from behind on a subsequent pass. Sutton was already signaling a new maneuver, which would bring them about and give Lily an angle of attack against the fleur de nuit, which was the largest of the French assailants. But before it could be accomplished, this next run had to be deflected. "'All hands at the ready! Stand by on the powder!' Lawrence said, using the speaking trumpet to amplify his orders, as the massive blue and black creature came roaring towards the... The speed of the engagement was far beyond anything Lawrence had ever before experienced. In the Navy, an exchange of fire might last five minutes. Here, a pass was over in less than one, and then a second came almost immediately. This time, the French dragon was angling closer towards Natidus, wanting nothing more to do with Temeraire's claws. The smaller Pascal's blue would not be able to hold his position against the great bulk. Hard to larboard! Close with him, he shouted to Tamarare. Tamarare answered at once. His great black wings abruptly swiveled and tilted them towards the fleur de nuit, and Tamarare closed more swiftly than a typical heavy combat dragon would have been able to do. The enemy dragon jerked and looked at them in reflex, and Lawrence shouted, Light the powder! as he caught a glimpse of the pale white eyes. He only just closed his own eyes in time. The brilliant flash was visible even through his eyelids. And the fleur de nuit bellowed in pain. <laughs> Lawrence opened his eyes again to find Tamarare slashing fiercely at the other dragon, carving deep strokes in its belly. And his riflemen started strafing the bellmen from the other side. <laughs> Tamarare, hold your position, Lawrence called. Tamarare was, was in danger of falling behind in his enthusiasm for fighting off the other dragon. With a start, Tamarare beat his wings in a flurry and lunged back into his place in the formation. Sutton's signal ensign raised the green flag, and as a unit they all wheeled around in a tight loop, Lily already opening her jaws and hissing. 
The fleur de nuit was still flying blind and streaming blood into the air as its crew tried to guide it away. Enemy above! Enemy above! Maximus's larboard lookout was... Oh, it's not Maximus saying it. Enemy above! Enemy above! Maximus's larboard lookout was pointing frantically upwards. Even as the boy shrilled, a terrible thick roaring like thunder sounded in their ears and drowned him out. A grand chevalier came plummeting towards, down towards them. The dragon's pale belly had allowed it to blend into the heavy cloud cover, undetected by the lookouts. And now its descendants, and now it descended towards Lily, great claws open wide. It was nearly twice her size, and outweighed even Maximus. Lawrence was shocked to see Masorius and Immortalis both suddenly drop. He realized belatedly it was the reflex which Celeritas had warned them of so long ago, a reaction to being startled from above. Natidus had given a startled jerk of his wings, but recovered. Dulcia had kept her position, but Maximus had put on a burst of speed and overshot the others, and Lily herself was wheeling around in instinctive alarm. The formation had dissolved into chaos, and she was wholly exposed. "'Ready all guns! Straight at him!' he roared, signaling frantically to Tamaraire. It was unnecessary." for after a moment's hovering, Tamaraire had already launched himself to Lily's defense. The Chevalier was too close to deflect him entirely, but if they could strike him before he was able to latch on to Lily, they could save her from a fatal mauling, and give her time to strike back. The four other French dragons were all coming about again. Tamaraire put on a burst of sudden speed and just barely slid past the reaching claws of the Pêcheur Coronet, and collided, collided with the great French beast with all his claws outstretched, even as the chevalier slashed at Lily's back. She shrieked in pain and fury, thrashing. The three dragons were all entangled now, beating their wings furiously in the opposite directions, clawing and slashing. Lily could not spit upwards. They had to somehow get her loose. But Temeraire was much smaller than the Chevalier, and Lawrence could see the enormous dragon's claws sinking deeper into Lily's flesh, even though her crew were hacking at the iron-hard talons with axes. Wow, can you just... I give anything to have a picture of that, right? And the guys are swinging the... King, king. Man. Get a bomb up here, Lawrence snapped to Granby. They would have to try and hurl one into the Chevalier's belly rigging, despite the danger of missing and striking Tamaraire or Lily. Tamaraire kept slashing away in a blind passion, his sides belling out for breath. He roared so tremendously that his body vibrated with the force, and Lawrence's ears ached. The Chevalier shuddered with pain. Somewhere on his other side, Maximus also roared, blocked from Lawrence's sight by the French dragon's bulk. The attack had its effect. The Chevalier bellowed in his deep, hoarse voice, and his claws sprang free. "'Cut loose!' Lawrence shouted. "'Tamaraire, cut loose! Get between him and Lily!' In answer, Tamaraire pulled himself free and dropped. Lily was moaning, streaming blood, and she was losing elevation rapidly." Having driven off the Chevalier was not enough. The other dragons were now as great a danger to her until she could get back aloft into fighting position. Lawrence heard Captain Harcourt calling orders whose words she, he could not make out. Abruptly, Lily's belly rigging fell away like a great net sinking down through the clouds, and bombs, supplies, baggage, all went tumbling down and vanished into the waters of the channel below. Her ground crew were all tying themselves to the main harness instead. Thus lightened, Lily shuddered and made a great effort, beating back up into the sky. The wounds were being packed with white bandages, but even at a distance Lawrence could see she would need stitching. Maximus had the Chevalier engaged, but the Peche Coronet and the Fleur de Nuit were falling into a small wedge formation with the other French middleweight preparing to take a dash at Lily again. Tamaraire maintained position just above Lily and hissed threateningly, his bloody claws flexing. But she was climbing too slowly. The battle had turned into a wild melee. Though the other British dragons had now recovered from their initial fight, they were no sort. Of, they were in no sort of order. Harcourt was wholly occupied with Lily's difficulties, and the last French dragon, a Peche, a Peche Rae, was a Peche Rae. 
I'll do it do my best, was fighting Masoria below. Clearly the French had identified Sutton as the commander and were keeping him out of the way, a strategy Lawrence could grimly admire. He had no authority to take command, but something had to be done. Turner, he said, catching his signal ensign's attention. But before he gave any order, the other British dragons were already wheeling around and in motion. Signal, sir. Uh, signal, sir, from, uh, from up around lead, form up around leader, Turner said, pointing. Lawrence looked back and saw Precursorus swinging, Precursorus swinging into Maximus's usual place with signal flags waving. Not being limited to the formation's pace, Choiseul and the big dragon had gone on ahead of them, but his lookouts had evidently caught sight of the battle, and he had now returned. Lawrence tapped Temeraire's shoulder to draw his attention to the signal. "'I see it!' Temeraire called back, and at once back-winged and settled into his proper position." Another signal flashed out, and Lawrence brought Tamarare up and in closer. Natidus also pulled in more tightly, and together they closed the gap in the formation where Masoria normally would have been. Formation rise together, the next signal came, and with the other dragons around her, Lily took heart and was able to beat up more strongly. Just a kind of a morale boost to be surrounded by her dragon uh, colleagues and her, their, their captains and such. Um... The bleeding had stopped at last. The trio of French dragons had separated. They could no longer hope to succeed with a collective charge, not straight into Lily's jaws, and the, uh, and the formation would be up to the level of the Chevalier in a moment. Maximus, break away, the signal flashed. Maximus was still engaged in close quarters with the Chevalier, and rifles were cracking away on both sides. The great regal copper gave a final slash of his claws and pushed away. Just a fraction too soon for the formation was not yet high enough, and another few moments were necessary before Lily would be able to strike. The Chevalier's crew now saw his fresh danger and sent the big dragon back aloft, a great deal of shouting going on aboard in French. Though he was bleeding from many wounds, the Chevalier was so large that it did not hamper him severely, and he was still able to climb quicker than the injured Lily. After a moment, Choiseul signaled, Formation, hold elevation, and they gave up the pursuit. The French dragons came together at a distance into a loose cluster, wheeling around as they considered their next attack. But then they all turned as one and fred fled rapidly northeast, the Peche Oreille disengaging from Masoria also. Temeraire's lookouts were all calling out and pointing to the south. When Lawrence looked over his shoulder, he saw ten dragons flying toward them at great speed, British signals flashing out from the long wing in the lead. Dun, 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 dun. The cavalry has arrived. Good stuff. The long wing was indeed Exidium. He and his formation accompanied them along the rest of the journey to the Dover Covert. The two heavyweight checkered nettles among them, taking it in turn to support Lily on their way. She was making reasonable progress, but her head was drooping, and so that the crew only barely managed to scramble off before she crumpled to the ground. Captain Harcourt's face was streaked with unashamed tears, and she ran to Lily's head and stood there caressing her and murmuring loving encouragement while the surgeons began their work. Lawrence directed Tamaraire to land on the very edge of the covet's landing ground so the injured dragons might have more room. Maximus, Immortalis, and Masorius had all taken painful, if not dangerous, wounds in the battle, though nothing like what Lily had suffered, and their low cries of pain were very difficult to hear. Lawrence repressed a shudder and stroked Tamaraire's sleek neck. He was deeply grateful for Tamaraire's quickness and grace, which had preserved him from the other's fate. Mr. Granby, let us unload at once, and then, if you please, let us see what we can spare for the comfort of Lily's crew. They have no baggage left, if it looks to me. Oh, very good, sir, Granby said, turning to give the orders at once. It took several hours to settle the dragons down and get them unpacked and fed. Fortunately, the covert was a very large one, covering perhaps one hundred acres, which included the cattle pastures, and there was no difficulty about finding a comfortably large clearing for Temeraire. Temeraire was wavering between excitement at having seen his first battle and deep anxiety for Lily's sake. For once, he ate only indifferently, and Lawrence finally told the crew to take away the remainder of the carcasses. <laughs> We can hunt in the morning, and there's no need to force yourself to eat, he said. Thank you. I truly do not feel very hungry at the moment, Temeraire said, settling down his head. 
He was quiet while they cleaned him, until the crewman had gone and left him alone with Lawrence. His eyes were closed to slits, and for a moment Lawrence wondered if he had fallen asleep. Then he opened them a little more and asked softly, Lawrence, is it always so after a battle? Lawrence did not seek, did not need to ask what he meant. Tamaraire's weariness and sorrow were apparent. It was hard to know how to answer. He wanted so very much to reassure, yet he himself was still tense and angry. And while the sensation was familiar, its lingering was not. He had been in many actions, no less deadly or dangerous, but this one had deferred in the, cr in the critical respect. When the enemy took aim at his charge... They were threatening not his ship, but his dragon, already the dearest creature to him in the world. Nor could he contemplate injury to Lily, or Maximus, or any members of the formation with any sort of detachment. They might not be his own temeraire, but they were full comrades in arms as well. It was not at all the same, and the surprise attack had caught him unprepared in his mind. It's often difficult... Afterwards, I am afraid, particularly when a friend has been injured, or perhaps killed, he said finally. I will say that I find this action especially hard to bear. There was nothing to, to be gained for our part, and we did not seek it out. Yes, that is true, Tamarer said, his ruff drooping low upon his neck. It would be better if I could think we had all fought so hard, and Lily had been hurt for some purpose. But they only came to hurt us, so we did not even protect anyone. That is not true at all. You protected Lily, Lawrence said. And consider, the French made a very clever and skillful attack, taking us wholly by surprise, and with a force equal to our own in numbers and superior in experience. And we defeated it and drove it off, drove them off. This is something to be proud of, is it not? I suppose that is true. Tamarer said, his shoulders settled as he relaxed. "'If only Lily will be all right,' he added. "'Let us hope so. "'Be sure that all, be sure that, all that can be done for her will be,' Lawrence said, stroking his nose. "'Come now, you must be tired. "'Will you not sleep? "'Shall I read to you a little?' "'I do not think I can sleep,' Tamarer said. "'But I would like you to read to me, and I will lie quietly and rest.' He yawned as soon as he had finished saying this, and was asleep before Lawrence had even taken the book out. The weather had finally turned, and the warm, even breaths rising from his nostrils made small puffs of fog in the crisp air. What a scene, you know, picturing that dragon. Leaving him to sleep, Lawrence walked quickly back to the covered headquarters. The path through the dragon fields was lit with hanging lanterns, and in any case he could see the windows up ahead. An easterly wind was carrying the salt air in from the harbor, mingled with the coppery smell of the warm dragons, already familiar and hardly noticed. He had a warm room on the second floor, with a window that looked out onto the back gardens, and his baggage was, had already been unpacked. He would looked at the wrinkled clothes ruefully. Evidently the, the servants of the covert had no more notion of packing than the aviators themselves did. Remember uh, when Lawrence first got to know these folks and saw them operating their dragons, they kind of just threw all their luggage in and baggage in haphazardly, and the fact that he had a sea chest, that he would fold his clothes and stuff like that, and they tried to get sort of special boxes that would work well with the harness and stuff, was kind of like shocking uh, to, the, to the aviator's culture. Um, <clears throat> There was a great noise of raised voices as he came into the senior officer's dining room, despite the late hour. The other captains of the formation were assembled at the long table where their own meal was going largely untouched. "'Is there any word about Lily?' he asked, taking the empty chair between Berkeley and Dulcia's captain, Chenery. Captain Harcourt and Captain Little of Immortalis were the only ones not present. "'He cut her to the bone, the great coward!' But that is all we know, Chenery said. They are still sewing her up, and she hasn't taken anything to eat. Lawrence knew that was a bad sign. Injured dragons usually became ravenous, unless they were in very great pain. Maximus and Masoria, he asked, looking at Berkeley and Sutton. Ate well and fast sleep, Berkeley said. His usually placid face was drawn and haggard. He had a streak of dark blood running across his forehead and into his bristly hair. That was damn quick of you today, Lawrence. We'd have lost her. 
Not quick enough, Lawrence said quietly, forestalling the murmur of agreement. He had not the least desire to be praised for this day's work, though he was proud of what Temeraire had done. Quicker than the rest of us, Sutton said, draining his glass. From the looks of his cheeks and nose, it was not his first. They caught us pla properly flat-footed, damn frogs. What the devil were they doing to have a patrol there? I would like to know. Uh, the route from Lagan to Dover isn't much of a secret, Sutton, Little said, coming to the table. They dragged chairs about to make room for him at the end of the table. Immortalis is settled in eating, by the way, by. The by. Speaking of which, please give me that chicken there. Please give me that chicken here. He wrenched off a leg with his hands and tore, it in, tore into it hungrily. Looking at him, Lawrence felt the stirrings of appetite. The other captains seemed to feel the same way. For the next ten minutes, there was silence while they passed the plates around and concentrated on their food. They had none of them eaten since a hasty breakfast before dawn at the covert near Middleborough. The wine was not very good, but Lawrence drank several glasses anyway. I expect they've been lurking about between Felixstowe and Dover, just waiting to get a drop on us, Little said after a while, wiping his mouth and continuing his earlier thought. By God, if you ever catch me taking Immortalis that way again, overland it is for now, from now on, unless we're looking for a fight. Right you are, Chenery said with heartfelt agreement. Hello, Schwassel, P pull up a chair. He shuffled over a little more, and the royalist captain joined them. Gentlemen, I am very happy to say that Lily has begun to eat. Uh, I have just come from Captain Harcourt, he said, and raised the glass. To the elf, may I propose. Hear, hear, Sutton said, refilling his own glass. They all joined in on the toast, and there was a general sigh of relief. Here you all are, then. Eating, I hope? Good, very good, Admiral Lenton said. He had come up to join them. He was the commander-in-chief of the Channel Division, and thus all the dragons at the Dover Coven. No, don't be fools, don't get up he said impatiently as Lawrence and Schwassel began to rise, and the others belatedly followed. After the day you've had? For heaven's sake! Here, pass that bottle over, Sutton. So you all know that Lily is eating? Yes, the surgeons hope that she'll be flying short distances in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, you have at least nicely mauled a couple of their heavy combat beasts. A toast to your formation, gentlemen. Lawrence was at last beginning to feel his tension and distress ease. Knowing Lily and the others were out of the danger was a great relief, and the wine had loosened the tight knot in his throat. The others seemed to feel much the same way. The conversation grew slow and fragmented. They were all much inclined to nod over their cups. I am quite certain that the Grand Chevalier was triumphalis. Choiseul was telling Admiral Lenton quietly, I have seen him before. He is one of France's most dangerous fighters. He was certainly at the Dijon covert, near the Rhine, when Precursorus and I left Austria, and I must represent to you, sir, that it bears out all my worst fears. A Bonaparte would not have brought him here if he was not wholly confident of victory against Austria, and I am sure more of the French dragons are on their way to visit Villeneuve. I was inclined to agree with you before, Captain. Now I am sure of it, Lenton said. But for the moment, all we can do is hope Mortificus... Uh, Mortiferous reaches Nelson before the French dragons reach Villeneuve, and that he can do the job. We cannot spare Exidium if we do not have Lily. I would not be surprised if it was what they intended by this strike. It is the clever sort of way those damn Corsicans think thinks. Lawrence could not help thinking of the Reliant, perhaps even now under the threat of a full-scale French aerial attack, and the other ships of the Great Fleet currently blockading Cadiz. So many of his friends ha and acquaintances, even if the French dragons did not arrive first, there would be a great naval battle to be fought, and how many would be lost without his ever hearing another word from them. He had not devoted much time to correspondence in these last busy months, and now he regretted the neglect deeply. "'Have we had any dispatches from the blockade at Cadiz?' he asked. "'Have they seen any action?' "'Not that I've heard of,' Lenton said." Oh, that's right. You're, you're our fellow from the Navy, aren't you? Well, I'll be starting those of you with uninjured beasts on patrolling over the Channel Fleet anyway, while the others recover. You can touch down for a bit by the flagship and hear the news. They'll be damn glad to see you. We haven't been able to spare anyone long enough to bring, the, bring them the post in a month. 
Will you want us tomorrow, then? Chenery asked, stifling a yawn, not entirely successfully. No, I can spare you a day. See to your dragons, and enjoy the rest while it lasts, Lenton said with a sharp, braying laugh. <laughs> I'll be having you rousted out of bed at dawn the day after. Oh, Admiral Lenton. Uh, why don't I just pause there, we'll leave you with that, and um, thank you for sticking with me. Gave you a good, uh, almost an hour of my, la my last time here. It's nightfall here, I have to do this after my kids are asleep. Uh, but appreciate your patience and sticking with me. And it's a labor of love. So I appreciate all the support, the subscription, uh, the subscribing, the comments. It's good stuff. And we'll see you on the next one. We'll finish up uh, chapter nine.